evening, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Shirley Liu, and it's my immense pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Marian Banjis. Marian is a designer, typographer, writer, and illustrator. Her award-winning work can be seen in magazines, design books, art exhibits across the world. She's been awarded an honorary doctorate of letters at Emily Card University. In 2011, she was named one of Wallpaper Magazine's 150 Movers, Shakers, and Makers. She has published two books, I Wonder and Pretty Pictures. In 2003, she left behind a lucrative design business to begin, as she describes it, an experiment in following love instead of money by doing what was highly personal, obsessive, and sometimes just plain weird. <laughs> Um, since then, she's designed magazine, magazine covers, laser-cut valentines out of used Christmas cards, manicured chairs uh, with salon aestheticians, and created glow-in-the-dark posters for the National. Her work incorporates everything from dry macaroni to <laughs> fake fur to delicate leaves and twigs from the forest floor. Her work is meticulous yet wild. In her words, inspiration is cross-pollinating. In her compelling 2010 TED, TED Talk, 2010 TED, 2010 TED, TED Talk, <laughs> she did a TED Talk. <laughs> um, uh, where am I? <laughs> I'm very interested in wonder in design as an impetus to inquiring. To say I wonder is to say I question, I ask. And to experience wonder is to experience awe. Please welcome Miriam Banjis. <laughs>
Graphic design as a, as a profession is a very young profession. It's um, it's only a, you know it's less than 100 years old, um, and certainly with the title of graphic design, it's it's probably less than 50 years old. So um, about 100 years ago, or you know 150 years ago, maybe you know in that in that range, around a century ago, graphic design that is design or you know anything that was designed, something that was for advertising. Um, Way it was done by artists. So you have people like Toulouse Lautrec, who's an artist um, who would do design. Um, Mondrian, of course, um, also doing design work. This is a little known piece by J.E.H. MacDonald, one of the group of seven, also made his living in part by doing design work. And that is, you know, commercial, commercial work, using typography and art together to create. Um, to create something that promotes something. Um, even uh, when there were when there were artists who were working primarily in that arena, um, <laughs> such as Alphonse Mucha, um, this being of course the classic art and vogue kind of uh, genre, you know he was he was also working in a very artistic way. The the, the work was really about the artwork with um, with a label of something attached to it. Renny Macintosh. Um, I believe this is by a guy named Pintoro. So um, there's this really wonderful set of um, uh, posters that were done for typewriters, for the, um, the Olivetti typewriters. They were done in sort of like the 20s through the 40s, and they're, and they're largely uh, artistically based. They have no, you know, a lot of them have absolutely nothing to do with typewriters. Here's one by the famous designer uh, Milton Glaser. You know, it does have a typewriter in it, but really, you know, in this day and age, this would not be accepted as an advertisement or something for a typewriter. Like, What's with the dog? <laughs> You know the construction of, um, of of design around typography and about around the letter forms. This was also something that was you know that was played with and experimented with. So it wasn't so much about the message or the product as it was about the visual appearance appearance of the design work. This is a piece by the famous designer Am Cassandra. Um, it's got a little bird. It's got an aperitif. I have no idea what the bird has to do with the aperitif, but it makes a wonderful image. And then moving into the 60s, even the, um, the sort of the greats of graphic design, designers that are, that are revered by all uh, graphic designers, such as Saul Bass, um, use this very illustrative, um, um, sometimes conceptual uh, approach to design. But again, it was, it was very much visually oriented. It was very much about, um, about the artists, uh, and it was Saul Bass as an artist, had a particular take on that thing. And then there was a designer named Paul Rand. And Paul Rand is probably the most famous and most revered graphic designer in the design industry today. Um, he's dead now, but he was, you know, he was operative um, throughout the 60s and until the 80s. Um, and, um, and he's known mostly for his logo work. So he did the Westinghouse logo, he did the original UPS logo, the ABC logo, the iconic IBM logo. And designers who revere um, uh, Paul Rand, I mean, he's the, he's the original modernist. He's the, well, he's not the original modernist, but he's the, he's the one who sort of um, encapsulated modernism in, in logo design. And, and designers who revere him think of him as very rational, um, very, uh, very modernist, very straightforward, no-nonsense kind of designer. And yet, he was also very whimsical. Um, so this is another piece that he did for IBM. It's a famous poster. And I don't know if you can see it, but down in the right-hand corner, there's a little, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little squiggly thing there. That's his signature. And Paul Rand did a lot of work that was that was very art-based, that was very whimsical, that was very much him. He, he, uh, you know, he cut things up and he put them together and he made things with his hands and he always signed them. So this is an annual report of an annual report cover for Westinghouse. Again, it's got Paul Rand's signature. 
This is beyond unheard of in graphic design. <laughs> nobody, nobody signs their, their, their stuff. Certainly not on the cover of an annual report. <laughs> Um, again, this is a this is an advertisement for paper, I believe. Paul Ram, his signature is in there. This one I particularly love is an advertisement for um, it's for a diarrhea medicine. Diarrhea, pectin. And then in the yellow, right to the left of the black, you can see his signature. And a book that he did of his work is called The Graphic Art of Paul Ram. So, designers started as art, started as artists, and then the, the the a profession evolved that was specifically for the development of commercial work, and those people generally turn, refer to themselves as graphic artists, and that's what I refer to myself as as a graphic artist, because I sort of follow in in the um, not in the footsteps so much, but I'm in that genre of graphic design or design and illustration, which is which, which I have a very personal take on. Um, you can see me in my work, and although I don't always sign my work, I, I do occasionally work a little signature in there somewhere. And um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very much sort of an old school kind of designer. What happens, um, you know, sort of in the 80s and beyond, particularly uh, once we started using computers and a lot more de design became democratized, is that design developed this very um, sort of um, it's not exactly modernist, but it but it has you know it has its roots in modernism, a very sort of uh, conservative way of, of being good clean typography plus conceptual picture that supports the that supports the message, and designers worked as um, they didn't. They didn't work as artists in any way. They didn't bring their own voice into the work. Um, what they are there to do is to meet with the client, figure out what the client needs, and this is this is how the vast majority of graphic designers practice today. What the client needs, and then they tailor their work to what the client needs. So they end up with uh, you know. So they you know they do sort of various. They, they get to make decisions about you know what size maybe a brochure is going to be and it's going to cut out in it, um, but basically it's, it's, you know, it's what I call strategic design. This is strategy built around what is good for the client and what is, uh, you know, what, what is going to fit into the market and, you know, with their competitors and all that other kind of stuff. So that, um, the, you know, there's this vast majority of graphic design which follows this model and again, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, generally what's considered good is to be, you know, clean and simple and direct and clear. And um, and tailored to the client, and I practiced graphic design like that um, for ten years. I'm going to back up a little bit um, and tell you that I started out as a book typesetter, and um, a typesetter is basically an extinct uh, uh, what do you call it um, job profession. That's what I was thinking. A distinct, uh, an extinct um, profession. So a typesetter was really a, a craftsperson. There was somebody who took instructions from a designer. A designer would, would come up with how something is going to look, and they would give these instructions to the typesetter, and the typesetter would use their knowledge of typography and their craft in order to, um, in order to make whatever it was. Usually, in my case, it was always books, sometimes magazines, make it look like the designer had envisioned it. Um, this doesn't happen anymore since since the advent of the desktop computer. Designers now do that themselves. But I did that for ten years working in books, and then I opened a, a graphic design company with a friend, and um, and I started doing doing graphic design work in the way that I just described as being a strategic graphic designer for uh, for clients, and I did that for ten years. And then I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore, and I really, I really wanted to do something more artistic. I, I wanted to draw. I wanted to bring myself into the work. I, quite frankly, wanted to have the work be about me as much as it was about the client. Um, I wanted to work in the way that the previous uh, graphic 
uh, graphic artists had worked, the, you know, the Paul Rams and the Saul Basses, where you could look at something and you could say, that's where they're badges. Um, and I wanted to do it because um, I, I really wanted to enjoy the work. I didn't, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be very artistic and very much sort of, as I say, from the heart or from myself. Um, so I left my graphic design company. And at the same time, I started writing for a blog that was about graphic design. It was called Speak Up. And I started writing these various articles. Um, you know, kind of, some of them were kind of quirky, some of them were very thoughtful. Um, but um, I, 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 wrote, I wrote for this blog for about three years, and I really, really enjoyed it. I mean, I've always loved writing, and this was, you know, this was a really great way to, to you know, reconnect myself with writing. And it became apparent to me that writing and design were something that went together hand in hand um, for me and for my work, which it just pretty much stayed to this day. Now, um, a few years ago, I started to think a lot about wonder. And I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about, the, I, I, I work in a very ornamental style. People, really have a response to my work that I couldn't quite understand. And I felt that it had something to do with wonder, something to do with them not knowing how I did what I did. And I was really interested in this idea of, um, of working with wonder and, and, of, and of evoking wonder. And I started to think a lot about religion and how um, religion and churches in particular, they've always used wonder uh, in this way. So, for instance, when you walk into a church uh, such, as, such as this one and you look up, you, you can't help but feel awe. You can't help but feel like, like you want to drop to your knees. And it's interesting because this is a man-made experience. It's, it's something that is it's designed to be that way. It's designed to make you feel that way. And uh, religions have used this this idea of wonder, um, you know, for throughout history, and I was also really interested in how they use it in books, um, and, and how the you know the, the original illuminated manuscripts were just so beautiful, and they were um, they were you know elaborate and they were ornamented, and they, this was done in ways that, to a, a modernist perspective of typography and of, and of design. It, you know, I said, no, no, you don't put stuff in the margins. You don't take away from the text. You, you, you know, you're supposed to leave it clean and simple so that people can just read it and focus on what's reading it. But I was much more interested in this, in this way of, of sort of getting lost in these, these elements on the page. And um, these were done for various reasons. And, and one of the reasons is, um, was actually, uh, you know, a lot of these, these illustrated pieces used to take out, the missionaries would take out these Bibles with these incredible illustrations, and they would be able to hold them up and show people, like, this is what I'm, you know, this is what I'm talking about, people were like, wow, like, wow, that's, you know, that's really amazing, they would feel this awe and this wonder. But it was also a way of, of honoring that text. The text is important, the text is, um, uh, you know, it's something that, that they feel is worth putting all that time and craft and effort into. So it's a way of, of saying that this text is, is really important. Um, it's, and, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's worth something. There's all sorts of other reasons to do with money and churches and all that other kind of stuff, which I won't, which I won't get into because uh, it goes on and on. But it's not isolated to, uh, it's not isolated to the Christian religion. Um, pretty much any religion I can think of uses ornament in this way, so that so things of a grand religion tend to be really detailed, and, and while um, Christianity has kind of lost this uh, this ornamented wonder, most other religions still carry it on. And if you look at you know anything the Buddhist uh, works and Hindu and that kind of thing, they're very elaborate, they're very ornamented, they're very detailed, and they have this sense of wonder and preciousness and um, and honor. And so, you know, it really came back to this, you know, what is it um, in that detail that the, the, the ornament does to people? What is it 
that, that makes people so drawn to it? Why do they respond to it? Sometimes even against their own rationality or preferred aesthetic. And I say this because with my work, um, a lot of people who are strict modernists really like my work, and I don't, I don't really know why. Now, I'm actually an atheist, so all that thinking about religion um, you know, is, is a little bit out of, my, out of my comfort zone. But I felt an increasing desire to prove that ornament and design has a purpose, and to use it for good in a secular context. So this brings me to my first book, which was I Wonder. I, I wrote and designed I Wonder. Um, it came out in 2010, and I think I worked on it in 2009. So it was about six years after I left my design company, and I'm, and I'm not showing you like tons and tons and tons of work that I, that I did during that period, but I'm, I'm jumping straight to I Wonder, because it's a book, and I thought you might be interested in books. <laughs> So, I wanted to create a book that was like an illuminated manuscript, and where the ornament was functional, where it aids in the telling of a story, and where the image is not separate from the words. So, so the image and the words are codependent, and one is not the same without the other. So I've got some fairly obvious influences here. Um, and I started with the chapter on wonder, which uh, contains some of what I was just talking about and a great deal more. But one of the things that's always really bothered me is any time that I'm reading about a visual subject and there's not visuals to accompany it, and I'm sure you've all had this experience, um, you know, particularly if you're reading about art or anything, somebody's going along, it happens to me every single time I read The New Yorker, um, you know, you read the art reviews and he's going along and he's talking about this painting or that painting or this photograph and you're like, what? What? Where? <laughs> this just drives me insane. And so I really felt that um, in order to, to write about wonder, that the, it should be an experience of wonder at the same time. I didn't want to just write a book that was just like plain old book that, that, wrote, that talked about these things but didn't show it at the same time. So the entire book is illuminated throughout. And um, the chapter on wonder is, um, you know, very, as I, as I say, the, the influence is obvious. Um, but I felt that, that it, was, it was really, um, it really created um, an, an entire an entire feeling of what I was talking about, so that you you were having an experience at the same time that you were reading it. It's quite an eclectic book, and I had a lot of different things that I wanted to put in it. Uh, one of the sections is uh, when I was when I was researching uh, all my various subjects. One of the things I was I was researching was ornament, and ornament has is one of these things that's been very controversial. Uh, really, since uh, bef you know, like at the time of Cicero, and, and you know, possibly even before. So uh, Cicero spoke against ornament in language, and you know, he felt that um, flowery language, language that was not straightforward, was was hiding something. It was obfuscating, obfuscating something. And this basic idea about ornament comes up over and over and over again throughout history, where. Um, People, uh, you know, it goes back to you know ideas of uh, a woman who wears makeup. Um, you know, she's hiding. She's hiding something. She's, uh, um, you know, she's she's not showing her real beauty. That kind of thing. Um, there's there's this suspicion of it that, that goes, um, you know, throughout the ages. And there's and there's all sorts of politics around it. Like people would make um, pronouncements about what is or was not acceptable in ornament. So, for instance. Um, at some point, it was not acceptable to have um, different different sizes of figures. So if you had a if you had an ornament that had a little horse like this, and then you had a little frog that was the same size as the horse, well, that was like completely wrong. You know, that was that was that was deeply frowned on. Um, and then there was and then there was you know sort of uh, these these um, these things against uh, any you know the I don't know if you ever seen those kind of. Uh, 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 got a human body that's coming out of a plant 
is turning into candlesticks or something like that. Like that was considered, you know, completely obscene, completely horrible. And so I, I went through and I found all these quotations about ornaments that were that were negative, that were, you know, that were saying how how terrible these things were. And in response to those, I wrote or I drew surrounds around those things that were that were basically kind of saying fuck you to whatever it was that the, that the, that the, that the text was saying. So I create this kind of conversation between the um, between the text and my illustrations that um, um, you know that, that have this this kind of conflict between them. And then of course. The only page in the book which does not have ornamentation on it is Less is More by Lise Andrew, and I'm sure there are people in this world who think that um, that's the only good page in the book. <laughs> um, so back to when I was writing for the, for the blog, um, one of the things that I found really interesting about, uh, about that was um, I knew a number of people who were writing for blogs and a number of people who would also published books from their blog posts, so it's not very common. And I was really surprised that nobody named anything of that. And, that you know, they, they basically would just take the text from the blog and they'd print it in the book, and that was the end of it. And I thought, like, this is really strange because a blog is not a book. There are different things, and there are different things that a book can do that, 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 that can't be done on the web. And so I had various articles that I had written for the for the blog that I thought were really um, you know really worthwhile articles. Some of them weren't because some of them were complete you know silly fluff. Um, but I thought but I had a core of them that I thought were really good and worth publishing in a book form. But I wanted them um, I wanted them to transform in some way. I wanted them to do something in a book that they couldn't do on the web. So one of the pieces that I wrote about um, was it came from a, a trip that I took to LA, and I went to the Griffiths Observatory in LA. And um, I originally went there because I was going to write about, uh, I was in LA just because I was, and, but I went to the Griffiths Observatory because I was going to write about the observatory. I you know, thought it was kind of an interesting subject. And while I was there, I saw a, um, I found this, this installation piece that they have in one of the hallways between, the, between parts of the uh, observatory. And what it is, is a very, very long um, uh, display of jewelry. There was jewelry all donated by one person, and it's all celestial-themed jewelry. So she's, she, had, she collected jewelry of stars and moons and suns and, and you know, these, various, these various things of all various kinds. And she donated it to the, uh, to the observatory, and they made this long hallway of, these, um, of, these, of this jewelry. So I took some pictures of the jewelry, and um, and then I wrote this blog post. Um, and and what I did instead of writing about either the observatory or about the jewelry, I wrote about the the um, the imagined uh, idea of looking through the telescope. And when you look through the telescope, what you see is this jewelry. So. I sort of made up this kind of quasi-fictional, quasi, um, you know, some, somewhat based in fact, uh, whimsical piece about, um, you know, five-pointed stars and six-pointed stars and these various galaxies and things that you can see um, through there. And, and, and what I did with the blog post was basically what I call a figure eight type illustration. So I've got, I've got a bit of writing, I write something, and then I show a picture of what I'm talking about as figure A. Writing, picture, writing, picture. Okay, so that's you know, pretty standard stuff. So when I repurposed this for the book, what I wanted to do was I wanted to, as I say, do something that couldn't be done on the web, and I wanted to create this immersive experience. So instead of having figure A-like illustrations, I surrounded the text with an entire matrix of jewelry. And nowhere in the text does it say, see left for what I'm talking about. But if you are reading it and you can see around you, you can see the five pointed stars and the six pointed stars and the galaxies and the moon and those various things. 
So in this way, as I, as I mentioned before, the, the, the text and the, and the imagery are not the same without the other. They need each other in order to create this whole experience. There's the title page for that. Another piece that I'd written about was um, I had been to my hometown of Saskatoon, and um, and I noticed in Saskatoon that it was it was riddled with these hideous signs. <laughs> I mean, they are everywhere in Saskatoon. It is crazy, and you know, like you know, they're in front of churches and they're in front of schools and they're in front of they're on people's lawns. And you know they're <laughs> and you know like they're they're, they're absolutely everywhere. I thought like, this is really weird. So I so again I you know I took pictures of the signs and I wrote an article for the web blog about these signs. And when it came time to bring this into the book, I I I decided uh, you know I started working with putting putting the signs in and. and Creating a kind of a, a surrounding for the signs that, that you know that had a similar look to it, but then I decided that I would rewrite the text as though they were signs. So where I had previously on the web log I had written paragraphs, I rewrote those paragraphs to be just like sign writing thing. Like you've seen one, you've seen them all until you see all of them all at once. <laughs> and I used the, you know, the sort of the sign vernacular for, for the writing for that, you know, with the, with the mismatched letters and the big letters and the smaller letters and the neon colors and the surround the whole, surrounded the whole thing with the more neon colors and more of these signs. So that the whole thing became this visual overload of, like the true experience of those, those Um, another article that I had written for the web blog was, um, was called Ye Old Graphic Designer. And in this I had discovered, um, I had I'd sort of gotten into heraldry in a kind of geeky sort of way. And, um, and I had discovered that um, heraldry, that actually I'm not, I'm not, in retrospect I'm not sure that this is entirely true. But at the time, <laughs> from my internet research, <laughs> I discovered that, that, that heraldry you know, has a kind of a, a language that when you, um, that, you know, that the crests and things are actual sort of little stories that you can read. There's symbolism in there that, that you know, like a, a, a standing griffin means something, a, a, a rampant lion means something. If it's a rampant lion on a green field, it means something different than a rampant lion on a, you know, on a bed of water or whatever. And so, um, and the other thing that I really liked about it was that, um, was that there were names for all of these things. So there is, um, there's a name for a lamb that has blood dripping from its hooves. There's a name for um, a, 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 winged, a winged thing that has an outline around its, around its feathers. These things all have names, and I thought that this was you know, really interesting and could be really useful um, for graphic design, because you know, instead of Instead of saying, um, you know, put a yellow box here with a diagonal line through it, you know, you could say, um, unfortunately, I'm not that versed in the language anymore, but, you know, like, um, um, you know, diagonally barred um, crest, oh, I don't know, you know, diagonally barred crest with an approved uh, <laughs> lamb and an emblazoned. Griffin, or something like that. So you 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 have this language that you could use to describe the elements, and at the same time you would have these stock elements that you could use to make things. So in this um, in this uh, uh, piece, you know, first I sort of talked about this language, and then I um, and then I talked about the idea of, of creating logos um, like you create crests. So that instead of like every time you have a uh, a changeover in a corporation, or basically any organization, you know, they want to change the logo. Uh, it's very, very common these days for, for um, corporations. You know, as soon as you get a new CEO, they want to change the logo. And, um, and it's ridiculous, you know, and it's, and it's so, you know, it's like time consuming and stupid, and they have a swoosh, and they take a swoosh off, and it's totally meaningless and totally stupid. 
So I propose that so I propose that you know that, that we can have this language and we can make a swoosh mean something. We can make a no mean something. So that you know if you had an entertainment company that was merging into a media company and and uh, you know was was getting an international scope, then you would sort of like add things to its logo. You would you know you have a little star for the entertainment. You would have a globe for the international part. And so that any time you looked at the logo, you could read the you could read what that company was about. So I, I suggested this sort of tongue in cheek, but also you know sort of semi serious. Now one of the things um, one of the things about uh, being an author and uh, being being a designer and the, the producer of a book and the typesetter is that um, setting type into little quarters like this is like really almost impossible to do unless you're the author and you can rewrite the paragraphs in order to fit <laughs> which is exactly what I did. So when I show this to certain students, I always make sure that they understand that, because otherwise they're going to try it with something and it's going to be, it's going to be really horrible. And I'm very, very, you know, having had 10 years of book type setting experience, I'm very, very fussy about my, about my, um, the spacing and stuff between words. Um, it has to look right, so I rewrote it to, to make it work that way. Um, another of the pieces that I had originally written um, for, the, for the blog uh, was a critique of the alphabet. And uh, this again is a um, uh, sort of an, an imaginary piece where I imagine that I'm a designer um, in charge of um, basically you know, well, critiquing the alphabet as though as though each letter of the alphabet were designed by somebody in particular. And I'm pretty scathing about most of the letters. And, um, <laughs> I say terrible things about them, and I say terrible things about the designers who supposedly designed them. And, Anyway, it's, it's great fun. Um, another piece I did was a diagram, and uh, this is this is a diagram of putting together two IKEA bookshelves. So it's very difficult to see here, but if you look at it in the book, you will see that um, all sorts of things happen while I'm, you know, while I'm putting together the IKEA bookshelves, which involve you know things like looking for a hammer and then finding the, the you know a certain um, you know, the, the hammer is somewhere underneath the like, underneath a bench, and the bench has to be moved. And then I realize that the bench needs to be, you know, sorted and cleaned out, and you know, all this other stuff has to happen before I actually get the hammer and, and you know go back to the bookshelf and so on and so forth. So it takes several pages of uh, very elaborate uh, diagramming in order to in order to get the bookshelves um, put together. Uh, there's a piece about the iconography of Santa Claus. Which again looks at looks at Santa as a, as an icon, um, which can be sort of broken down into into his various uh, iconographic parts. And then there's this piece about honor, and this again is one of the ones that I that I wrote from scratch for the book, and talks um, about honor as I as I have mentioned it before, and about this idea of um, honoring the work that you have, and in particular honoring the page and. This goes back, you know, sort of to the fundamental basics of this book, in that, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a basic understanding in graphic design today that by honoring the text, you, you give it space, you give it space to read. And this sort of has its origins in a quotation by um, a woman named Beatrix Ward, uh, who wrote a who wrote a small article, I think in the 20s called the Crystal Goblet. And she makes an analogy of um, a page of text um, that it should be that it should be like a crystal goblet. So you don't want to drink your wine, your, your beautiful precious wine from um, you know a metal goblet or something that where you where you where you you know it leaves a taste or you know it has some other experience. You want to drink your wine from a crystal goblet where it, it has, um, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the taste of the wine. You can see the wine perfectly, and it's, it's just, uh, it's just a holding vessel. It's not, it's not putting else any, anything else into the wine. And that's the idea with the page. Is the page is supposed to be the crystal goblet where you really concentrate on the words. The page itself is not, um, is not uh, um, something that is getting in the way of the words. 
But um, I started to think about um, another analogy, and that made the analogy of the um, the uh, Japanese. Or, hang on a second. Oh, no, that's that's fine. You can use that there. Uh, of the Japanese uh, tea cup, and um, for the Japanese, the tea cup is is a very important object in and of itself. It has a story. Um, it's you know the way it was made, the way it's fired. It has beauty. Uh, if it's broken, it can be mended, and even that mending becomes part of the experience of that tea cup. And uh, the tea ritual that you have, to, the, the tea cup itself, is a very important part of that drinking. And so for me, um, to honor the text, I'm using more of the teacup analogy. I, I think that, uh, for instance, when we have created, in the past when we've created documents that are of importance, and this uh, is a document that's actually, again, at the Griffiths Observatory, but it's a document that, that announces the, um, the giving of the land um, by um, uh, the Griffiths. Uh, family to the city of Los Angeles for this for this park, and it's very traditional that, that when we have something, when we have an important announcement like this, either it's a you know a birth certificate or or um, you know a deed of uh, a deed of a gift like this, or you know even even today it's gotten a bit bad. You know we give out our certificates that are printed out in light on laser printers, and you know they look pretty awful, but. Up until up until about 20 years ago, it was still very traditional to to put a lot of work into it to have something that was engraved, something that was beautiful, something that was ornamented, and that is how you honor that occasion or that um, or that text. So I was writing I was writing about these ideas about how we honor things, how um, in the past um, you know even even things like armor. Um, for, for noble people was, was ornamented. Um, weapons, um, these things that were of importance, that were, um, that were for people of importance, um, were honored in this way. So I created these surrounds around the text for, for honor um, out, of, out of pasta. And I did this partly because, oh, this is me working at, this is 10 times speed, I was working slow that. Um, and, this is, and this is partly because um, I wanted to do something that, uh, I, I do like to make juxtapositions. I like to make juxtapositions between things that are old and new and things that are expected and unexpected. And this is sort of one of those unexpected things. But I was also thinking about, um, about how children play with, or not, they, they, in kindergarten quite often, you know, children make things out of macaroni, it's a project, you know, and they glue the stuff on the, on the paper, and then, they, and then they give it to their parents, you know, it's this sort of this honorific kind of thing, well, that's this thing that I've made for you. So I, was, so I had that in my mind as well when I was, when I was working with the pasta. And the pasta is, um, as you can see, I, I had no sketches for it, no drawings, I really just had a, an outline that I had put down um, uh, with um, thread on pins that showed me the area that I was going to be filling with the pasta, and um, and then used uh, and then basically just made it up as I went along with all the different kinds of pasta and, and made these um, these different surrounds for the text um, around the honor pages. Um, in most of my long written work like this, my my my, um, my typography is sometimes uh, a little experimental, but usually usually fairly fairly straightforward. I'm not really a fan of what I call jumping type, like um, you know when you when you're reading and something you know sometimes designers like they make one word big and they make another word italic and then they and then they I don't know they you know sort of do all these crazy things with type. I don't I don't really like that. That really is sort of Fox up the reading for me. Um, but on the other hand, I do have a bit of a penchant for illegibility. <laughs> it just depends on the situation. So um, in the book, I wonder most of it, most of it is perfectly legible, but I do have a couple of um, a couple of sections that are that are not perfectly legible. And um, it's because they're about secrets. So there's two parts to this chapter that I that I have. It's about secrets, 
And um, the first part in gold on the right is written in a, in a font that I designed um, that, um, that is very difficult to read, but not impossible to read. So it's, um, you know, you, once you look at it enough, you can start to see the letter forms in there, and then you can, you know, you can slowly read it, and then, you know, you can read it reasonably, reasonably quickly. It's not an exit sign, so it's okay. <laughs> um, but the other sign is not legible. The other sign is a cipher. And um, a cipher is a type of code uh, where basically a uh, letter or symbol or number or something is replacing each letter in the alphabet. And so this is a, a visually based cipher um, that I devised. And um, I made a font out of it, which only I have. If you if you had this text in a digital form with the font, you would be able to highlight it and put it in Garamond or something and you'd be able to read it. Um, but I'm the only one who, who, has the, who has the code. I did get an email from somebody um, a little while ago who cracked it. Yeah, and I was very impressed. Um, I'm sure for, you know, for a good crypto cryptographer it would not be that hard because a cipher generally is, is the, most easy, you know, the easiest code to crack. However, the way I've done it, um, it being visually based, is quite difficult. Um, but anyway, so one person has cracked it. And the reason that I, that, I, that I did this part of the cipher is that they are actual secrets. These, the, the content of this is uh, from love letters exchanged between me and a, and a person who shall remain forever of <laughs> mute. <laughs> Um, another another section of the book is about um, where, where am I at here? Oh, I'm at 41 minutes. Okay, uh, I better move along. Um, another section of the, book, of the book is about memory and photography, and um, this is actually the least commented on. Like when people tell me, you know, how much they love the book, or they like this, or they like that, they never mention this chapter. And it's actually, in my opinion, the best the best written chapter, the most thoughtful chapter, the most interesting chapter. Um, and it's about, um, it really came about because I was um, entrusted by my family with, with creating, um, uh, with doing something with our family photo albums. And I'm also really interested in, in family photography. This is, a, this is a, a photograph of somebody I don't know. Um, this is not a photograph of my family. <laughs> it could have been. Um, I found this photo on the street in Vancouver years ago, uh, wearing up in leaves. And, and you know, I'm just, I've been fascinated with it. I kept it, I've been fascinated with it ever since. And I was like, who are these people? And why were they left in the leaves on the street? You know, it's just it's so strange. But there is, you know, the, my family is not unknown to smearing themselves with mud and, you know, being naked and stuff like that. So. It's a little funny. Um, and, but anyway, when it came to the, 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 the photos of my own family, I really, I had a really hard time because there are these, um, like this is my mother um, in the 1950s, and she's just such a, she's such a, she's, and, you know, I'm looking at her through, you know, through the, through the past. I know how her life unfolded. There are so many warnings I think I would like to give her. Um, you know, she looks she looks so happy here. This is this is you know she's written underneath it the expert, which you know which she clearly is not. But it's it's just such a, I don't know there's something so poignant about it. Um, and even you know pictures of myself um, when I was little. And there's just like this this incredible poignancy of of um, of time that, that you find in these things. And, and I really wasn't sure like how to, and a lot of, a lot of the photo albums were falling apart. Um, you know, they were sort of disintegrating, especially the ones that had uh, my mother's handwriting on them. And I wanted to preserve them, but I also didn't want to separate the photos from, from my mom's handwriting. And there's, there's, there's also all these pictures of people that I don't know. I mean, and they're, I, and they're, they were friends of my mom's from the 1950s or whatever. I had no idea who they are, they're complete strangers. They're as strange to me as those people that I found on the street. And so to me and to my family, they're, they're nothing anymore. They're meaningless. They might as well you know, be 
tossed out, and yet they're part of my mother's narrative, and they're part of that, you know, they're part of that thing. So it became this really, it's actually a really difficult uh, thing that I never figured out. I ended up like just leaving these disintegrating phone levels the way they were because I couldn't, I couldn't bear to dismember them. Um, and it's something that is something that I still haven't solved. But anyway, so all of these ideas about photography and memory and, and families and that kind of thing, those are those are all in that um, in that story there. And the other really personal piece that I wanted to include in this book was um, was specifically about my mother and um, some notebooks that she left behind. So as long as I can remember, my mother um, she had these. Uh, what we call steno notebooks, they've got a coil binding at the top. And she kept them on the table and she would write to-do lists and she would write down things that she was listening to on the radio or things that she should listen to on the radio or um, you know, water the plants, um, send presents to friends, phone people, all, the, all these reminders of things that she had to do. And um, the, the amazing thing is that she kept these notebooks for 30 years. So when she died, I found like this whole box of these notebooks in the basement. And you know, when you first look at them, you think, well, they're, you know, they're just like these, they're just no, they're just lists. There's notebooks, and lists of things to do, and, and things are crossed off, and things are underlined, and things are circled. And um, I was just amazed at how much of her personality came through this, and how the seasons went by, and you know, she had to. She had to buy nasturtiums, and she had to buy um, you know geraniums, and she had to water the plants, and then you know, and then she had to rake leaves, and she had to put banding on the trees, and then she had to you know plug in the car, and and you know shovel the walk, and do these things. So you can see the you can see the time going by. Every single person who was ever of significance to my mother was in these notebooks. You know, in terms of phoning them, writing to them, sending them letters. It was just an absolutely astonishing thing. And even in, in, in some of the early ones, uh, I, I found these notes from, from we, when me and my brothers were still living at home. So there became these, these interactions between my mom and, and me and my brothers, and notes to each other, you know. And me, me trying to make notes to mom while, while, I, while she was on the phone. And, and um, what is this? Um, I mean, just, I mean, I mean, you know, just, some of them are just hilarious. And I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to her, I'm asking her to nod, I'm, ask, I'm asking her something, and I'm asking her, like, can I do something? Down in the, down in the corner there, I've written a box, and yes, no. <laughs> and she's going to, no, whatever it is I'm asking her, she's like, no. <laughs> so, in this last chapter of the book, I, 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 um, I turn the pages inside out, where the, where the visual is, is these notebooks from my mother, they're on the inside. And basically what I did was, I mean, I just stripped out you know, lines from, from the various notebooks um, and put them all together. And then on the, in the outside of the margins, I put the, my own text, which is sort of describing some of the things that are, that are going on in the notebooks. Um, there's a pause in the middle of the book, and it's the only section without words, and it shows portraits from the cemetery. Cemeteries, and um, this section sort of in quiet, quietly encompasses the whole. Um, memory, honor, secrets, and wonder are all expressed without words in these in these images. Um, that's that's from the introduction of the book, and um, the it was really it really it really seemed like a very eclectic uh, group of material. But what I was really surprised is that when I put the whole thing together, it did somehow manage to, to come together in this, um, in a very cohesive way that I had never really anticipated. So, um, there were, you know, these, these themes of wonder, honor, and memory just kept turning up like threads running throughout the book. And in the end, it made a really surprisingly satisfying whole. And that's it. Um, there's, I think, eight, nine copies, I brought nine copies of this. Um, it's actually out of print right now, which I was a little shocked to discover, and I wrote to my publisher just the other day to find out what's going on. Um, but anyway, I brought eight of my own copies here uh, for sale um, outside. Um, now, a couple of years ago, I did a second book, and this is a very different book. Um, it's a very similar book, but a very different book. 
is, is similar in that it's visual, um, but it's different because, um, you know, I wonder I created all the material specifically for the book. This is a monograph of my work. It's called Pretty Pictures. And um, so it's, it's a compendium of, the, of all of my work in the last 12 years. Um, it starts with, with some um, semi-original pieces that I, did, that I did for the book, but most of it is, almost in, in all of it is existing work that I've done in the past. Um, so what I did with this was I, I took all the work, I curated it, um, I, you know, um, selected what images were going to have sketches and whatnot and all that other kind of stuff, and I designed it and produced it, and uh, it's published by Thames and Hubs, which, which the last one was as well. So it starts, it's, it's purely chronological. I decided to do um, a completely chronological uh, design for it so that people could really see the development of my work over the years and see how my work changes, because it hasn't changed a lot. Um, and it starts, this is, this is the, uh, the basic design work that I, I've got like two pages of, of the design work I did for 10 years um, with tiny little images. And then it gets into the work that I've been doing for the past, um, for the past 10 years, since 2003. And um, it's, um, it's a book that, um, like I say, I designed it, um, I designed it myself. I designed it to have a basic, um, a basic structure, you know, it's, it's got basic margins and, and placement for uh, running heads and folios and that kind of thing. But uh, outside of that, I didn't want to use a strict grid for the uh, for the design of the book. And so the um, so the so the face each facing page I designed kind of like I would design a poster. So I have these various elements, and they are um, they have their own alignment with each other. So uh, they're not conforming to a grid, but they're conforming to a relationship between the other things on the pages. Um, so each uh, the way I, the way I did this was after assembling the materials, um, I laid out each page uh, spread essentially as a as a design unto itself that, that had you know, balancing all the images and that kind of thing, and then I wrote all the text to go with it. And um, it is 200, I forgot, 272 pages, I think. Um, it was a huge amount of work. Uh, and, and I designed it and wrote it in a way, um, I, I certainly had students in mind, but I also, I've been talking about this work for, I've been talking about it since about 2005, I think. And uh, I've spoken at over over a hundred conferences and events, and I was just sick to fucking death of talking about this work. And I really wanted to get everything I've ever said into this book. I wanted it to be a complete summation of uh, all the work that I've that I've done in the past ten years, and and for students and designers who are interested in my work to. Um, to me, you know, anything they wanted to know, it was in there. There's, as I said, some of them, you know, go through sketches and process, and others of them don't. I've got bad work in there. I've got great work in there. I've got, you know, um, work. I've, I've got rejected work in there. Um, so basically, everything that I've done, um, I included in the book. And I'm super, super happy with how it turned out. Um, I think it's, a, I think it's a really good book, but it's, you know, it's very different from my wonder. I consider I wonder to be my masterpiece, and I consider this to be my epitaph. <laughs> so there's a few copies of this out, outside as well. That's the back cover there. Now, where are we at? We're done? Okay. <laughs>
Um, we also have